Hey everyone, this is Bath Metrics. Welcome to episode five of my video series called Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero. In this video, I'll be explaining what it means to saturate from the bottom which is always the first step when trying to make sounds that are loud enough to fit into a loud mix. Before I start, I should point out that this is part of an ongoing video series. I'm going to be building out this playlist on my YouTube channel. So I'm going to be covering a whole lot of juicy topics all about the clip to zero method, start to finish. We're here on episode five. All of these topics are still coming. I'm putting them out as fast as I can, trying to do it one a day if possible. And uh, you might benefit from subscribing to my channel so you can be aware of each new episode as they come out. Okay, so <clears throat> in today's video, oops, I should make one other thing clear. Let me also make clear that I paid for all the plugins I'm gonna be showing you in this video. I don't have any promotional relationship with any of these vendors. They're just great plugins I rely on all the time. So these are my personal recommendations. All right, so the subject of today's video is controlling dynamic range with saturate from the bottom. And I separate my process of dynamic range control into two parts, saturating from the bottom and clipping from the top. And we always do the saturating first. And the reason I separate these is because there's a potential for confusion, especially for new people and even for experienced people, because experienced producers and engineers know it's a very elementary basic fact that saturation is usually a form of soft clipping, okay? But everyone gets confused because not everyone understands the difference between clipping and other types of processing very well. And maybe they've heard of clipping, but they don't know there's a big difference between hard clipping versus soft clipping and the way that they sound and why you would use one versus the other. A lot of confusion here. So what I'm trying to do by breaking the process apart into saturation versus clipping is to help make really, really clear and obvious that when I talk about clipping in my method, I'm talking about a very specific type of clipping, and it's very different from what we normally think of as saturation. So let's talk about this. Let's, let's get this out of the way before we, we go on. Um, There's two types of clipping, and it all has to do with how quickly or rapidly you go from a linear volume response to suddenly clipped across the top, right? So in hard clipping, the signal stays perfectly normal. Whatever's coming in is the amount that's going out until suddenly you hit the threshold of the clipper and everything is cranked to absolute no more volume that your volume just stops at that point and doesn't keep climbing one for one. This is called a non-linear transition. It was linear and then suddenly it's no, no longer linear. If it was linear, it would keep going in this direction. And any kind of non-linear transition always creates a little spit of distortion. It always creates distortion, okay? Now, soft clipping is also a non-linear transition, but it's a more gradual kind of non-linear transition. And so the distortion that's involved with it sounds different. And more importantly, you're actually changing the volume of all your little valleys and peaks and little harmonics and you know, so on and so forth in your waveform. You're changing the level of those in this gradual manner long before you get to the threshold of the clipper. So long before it actually goes flat, it's, it's reducing the volume of sounds below the threshold, unlike hard clipping. And the long and short of it is, this kind of clipping is very audible. It's very colored. It changes the timbre of your sound in a noticeable way. And so that's why I make the point that saturation which is 
another name for soft clipping. Saturation is a sound design tool. It makes an audible color change, and it's very much not a transparent kind of clipping. It's, it's clipping you're meant to hear. It's clipping for taste. Now, the way it actually sounds um, is it makes something sound warmer, darker, fatter, thicker, more bassy. You're going to hear all these kind of adjectives like this. If you put a soft clipper or a saturator, those are synonymous terms. If you put a saturator on a sound, it's going to get a little warmer. It's going to get a little thicker, fatter, denser, etc., more bassy. And it's happening because if we look at one other image here, it kind of shows us in a different way. Um, let's say you have a sine wave coming in, and here's your clipping threshold on both sides. The sine wave looks perfectly normal right up until the very minute it's shaved flat by a hard clipper. Absolutely nothing about this sine wave is changing at all, okay? That's one reason hard clipping is more transparent if you don't overdo it and make this long, this, this flat top too long, right? Um, the signal doesn't change at all except right at the very instant that it's being clipped, and then it goes right back to normal again. But if you're soft clipping, this original shape becomes more rounded. And so all your all of your waveforms, if you if you understand how sound works, it's a whole bunch of different sine waves all layered on top of each other. And all of those sine waves that exceed the clipping threshold are getting reshaped with this slightly rounded edge. They're getting slightly rounder and fatter. And this shifts the kind the timbre of the signal a little darker, a little warmer. It it makes everything a little more um, for lack of a better word, bassy or subby sounding at some, some level that you can hear. And so our brains just perceive it as pleasant and warm and fat. Um, but it is audibly changing the timbre of things. So saturation can very much reduce and control the dynamic range, but it does it in a way that's always colored. And it's something you always want to do first as part of your initial sound design for a sound. Clipping, on the other hand, in the next video where I talk about creating the CTZ clippers on your buses and tracks, that type of clipping is going to be hard clipping. And the whole goal of that clipping is to be very, 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 very transparent. You shouldn't hear it. You shouldn't notice it. Okay, unless you're listening with a super critical ear and you know exactly what to listen for. So two very different types of things, but they both work to reduce the dynamic range of the sound. And that lets you make that sound louder in a loud mix. So again, if you're working in a loud genre, if you're struggling to hit the loudness of the genre you're producing in, the problem is usually that you're picking sounds in your synthesizer patches or you're making your own sounds in your synthesizers, doing your own sound design or you're pulling samples out of a sample pack or dropping them in a sampler and chopping them up and doing all the fun th things we do. Um, but those sounds you're starting with very, very often aren't loud enough to, to fit into a loud framework of a super loud kick, a super loud snare, and a sub that's up there at the same level as the kick and the snare. Your sounds are just too wimpy, they're too quiet. And so to get them louder, you have to somehow reduce the distance between the peaks of the sound, these prickly little peaks right here. You need to squeeze those in towards the thicker, fatter body of the sound, okay? You need to make what's called the crest factor smaller. That's this measurement here, and we're going to be looking at crest factor really closely in a minute. But let me, let me play this sound for you. We're going to be listening to this particular sound. Uh, you're going to hear some gappy places in it. That's my kick and drum uh, duckers cutting into it. I'm going to stop it there because that's a good example of where the dynamic range is getting a little wide. Uh, in the context of the whole mix, 
Okay? So, in this particular case, the crest factor is already good. It's already, it's already loud. It's already sitting up in a loud mix where it needs to sit. But we're going we're gonna to play games with it and make it different and better by using saturators. So this is the way we're going to be playing with. But I want you to focus on this peak right here that's going, it's actually out past the zero dB line. These little white lines, this one here is zero on the positive side. This one's zero on the negative side. Let me just make this whole thing bigger so it really stands out. Okay, this white line here is zero. So that peak's going over zero because this is all happening. I'm, I'm, I've got my scope in front of the clipping stuff at the end of the track, right? So we're looking at the raw signal before I throw a clipper on. And so what we want to try and do is minimize the amount of work your clippers have to do. You don't want them squashing any more peaks than they need to, or you're going to get more distortion than you might want, and it's going to be less transparent. The whole goal with the clip to zero method is to control these peaks that are going above zero as transparently as possible. So the fewer of those that there are, the better the result's going to be by the time you get to actually clipping this stuff. You can't just put a really huge caterpillar spiky signal into a clipper and expect it to sound good. You're going to hear too much distortion. It's not going to sound transparent. So our first goal is to play games with saturation to thicken up the middle part of this waveform to make the average RMS of the waveform louder and also pull in these peaks closer to the waveform a little bit because again, saturation almost always involves a type of clipping that's already gonna reduce some of these peaks, okay? So let's see how this works. Let me put this down here, make sure I can get to all the things I need to get to. Yeah, all right. I want you to be able to see everything. So we're gonna focus on this meter. This is DP meter. Uh, I told you it was one of the must have plugins. It's free, there's no reason not to have it. It has two modes. The EBU mode lets you measure all kinds of loudness targets. The RMS mode is particularly useful because it can show us average RMS, peaks versus sample peak if you care about uh, true peak, sample peak versus true peak if you care about true peak, which I usually don't. And then most importantly, I like it for this crest factor meter. Now, one thing to know about DP meter, by default, it may have sync off. You want to turn this on because what it does is it freezes the meters when you play your DAW and then it, I'm sorry, it freezes them when it stops. And then when you restart playback, it resets the meters. So watch, here we are starting in this default state. So it's making some measurements. And as soon as I stop playback, everything freezes. And that's really helpful to let you see values that normally want to float around and keep dropping once you stop playback. By turning this on, everything freezes. And then when I start playing again, it just resets and starts measuring again. Okay, so we're going to be paying attention to this crest meter because this is crest factor. And what this is, it's an ongoing averaged calculation for as long as you're playing, okay? So it's kind of like integrated LUFs. If you play a really short segment, it's going to be a very different number than if you play a long segment of something because it's going to be factoring in all the quiet parts of the sound and all the louder parts of the sound. They're all being factored into it. Now, what it is specifically is every 600 milliseconds when it takes an RMS measurement, it's also looking at the sample peak. And it's saying, what is the distance between the peak? How far is this peak right here above the average RMS of the waveform at the same moment? And it keeps that little number and starts adding it up. And every 600 milliseconds, it's taking a new measurement of the distance of the peak, I'm sorry, distance of the peak from the RMS, okay? And it's just averaging all that over time for as long as you're playing. So it's a measurement that kind of averages out all of these little peaks sitting above the fatter, thicker RMS of the waveform, all these little peaks, how far are away are they on average from the average loudness of the waveform itself all through here? It's a really, really useful number. Um, 
So what I'm going to show you is how just applying different types of saturation to this sound are going to pull in the peaks a little bit and increase the loudness of the center portion. That's the saturate from the bottom. We're, we're increasing the perceived loudness in the bottom of the waveform somehow through various methods. And it's also going to probably pull the peaks down a little bit. And so what we're going to see is this crest factor number will go down. It will go lower if it's an effective form of saturation that's helping you control dynamic range a little bit long before your clippers ever get to it. So let's see this in action. And let me show you kind of my quick cheat sheet. The first thing to remember is you always want to use the saturators before the clippers at the end, the CTZ clippers. Saturation comes first. It's part of your sound design. It's part of all your other EQ or compression or whatever sound design choices you're making, chorus, reverb, I don't care, right? It's part of your sound design. And it's going to reduce the crest factor a little bit so that your clippers at the end don't have to do as much work. That's the whole goal. And some of the most effective ones in terms of pulling these peaks inward are going to be wideband saturators and New York compression. Now, I don't really like New York compression in most cases. <laughs> I don't like the way it sounds, but it does do a really good job of reducing the crest factor. And of course, a wideband saturator is just a soft clipper, so it's clipping the hell out of these peaks, but it's also changing everything below the peaks. So it colors it too, but it is effectively a clipper. So it is going to pull these peaks in and reduce the crest factor. But the more interesting ones are my favorite tool that I said was a nice to have tool in the clip to zero method, which is something called Spectre. So I'm going to show you how Spectre works. And Spectre is a little more um, unpredictable in terms of how much effect it will have on your crest factor. It kind of depends. And the same is true of tape emulators like um, a typical vintage tape emulator like Slate's, Slate's, what do they call those, virtual tape machines. It's great sounding, so it's the one I use. But there's also things like Kramer Master Tape, and there's plenty of others out there. This is a kind of saturator. It does other things too. It adds wow and flutter and analog noise in the background and all kinds of stuff, but at its heart, it's also trying to mimic the classic saturation of tape machines, right? So it's going to have an effect sometimes too, but kind of like with uh, Spectre, whether or not a tape emulator is going to have a significant effect on your crest factor kind of depends on the material. It's going to have more of an effect on some types of signals and less of an effect or no effect on other types of signals. So we're just going to, I'm going to demo all these to you, let you see what they're like, let you understand this process. Okay, so let's start with the obvious one. We're going to turn on just a one knob saturator, tiny little bit of saturation. Uh, and actually, before I turn it on, let's take a measurement. So it's off now, even though you're seeing it on screen. We're going to measure the crest factor of this entire uh, four bars right here in this clip. This is what we're listening to. So we're going to let it run end to end. I'm going to stop it at the very end and we're going to see what the crest factor reads. Okay, here we go. We'll kill it at that tail there. So we got a crest factor of 11.6. Keep that number in mind, 11.6, right? If, if any of these devices we try make that number smaller, then we are reducing the dynamic range and therefore able to you know, push the fader louder and make the sound sit louder in the mix, okay? So first we'll enable 
this Yankee saturation knob. This is a janky plugin. You're probably going to hear glitches. I hate this thing, but it was the only one knob saturator I had in my product. So my project. So let's try this out. So again, this will just restart automatically. We should get a different number. And you'll also maybe notice some differences in the waveform. Okay, look at that. We went from 11.6 to 8. That means this RMS in the middle got much louder than the peaks, right? The peaks effectively pulled in closer to the RMS, and that's exactly what we want. Now, whether or not we like the sound of this saturator remains to be seen. I'm going to go through and demo all these, and then we'll do a bunch of back and forth A-B comparisons, and I'll show you why I love Spectre so much. Okay, let's move on to... Saturn. A lot of people have Saturn. Some people have trash. It's the same thing. And I'm just using a simple, basic, warm tape setting. Nothing fancy. Let's uh, measure the crest factor with this on. Okay, again, nice and low. Remember, this was 11.6 originally. The waveform is much louder. Peaks are much closer. Whether we like the sound of that or not remains to be seen. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Closing you. Let's do... Uh, first, I'm going to do Pro-Q3. Now, this isn't a saturator. What I'm doing though, is I'm saying to myself, and this is what I did in this, this real project. I said, okay, I like this basic sound, but I feel like in the mid-range area here, it needs a little more beef, just in the mid-range. So a lot of us would just reach for an EQ and do a couple you know, mid-range boosts. This is pretty aggressive. Uh, you'll hear the difference in sound. Let me turn this off. I'll disable it this way, okay. That's the original sound. So see, I'm trying to give a little more emphasis to this mid-range area. Now, it doesn't sound good. It sounds honky. I mean, look where I'm putting these filters. 400, that's the honk range, right? 1770, not so bad, but that's going to cut into the clarity of other sounds. But overall, this sounds a little honky, and it also sounds a little phasey, because even though these are gentle... Um, bell filters, they still change phase. That's how EQs work. They change the phase relationship of things. So I'm, I'm actually causing certain parts of this very interesting signal to phase with itself in ways that it wasn't doing in the original. Let me let you hear this. I'm going to play, just listen to the quality of the full sweep as it sweeps upward. You're going to hear the phasing. Okay. Now here's the original. Hear how that sounds even as it sweeps up? There's an evenness to the volume of all the frequencies you're hearing as it sweeps upwards. Now when I turn this on, listen how we get some dropouts as it hit, as it rolls up through this region. Hear how some of those those peaks those resonant peaks in there got thinner and, and phased each other out as they go up. Okay, I don't think it sounds very pleasant, even though it is giving me a little more of what I want, okay? But now let's compare, and also before I stop, let's see what the crest factor measures out when we use this approach. <laughs> 
Remember, it was 11.6 in the dry signal. So it didn't reduce the crest factor. It made the sound better in some ways, because I mean, I did get some boosts here, but also made the sound worse in some ways um, because it created phasing. So, you know, everyone reaches for EQ to beef up sounds, but I, I think there's a better way. And this can, in many cases, since I'm actually increasing the volume of certain areas, I could actually increase the crest factor depending, right? Now let's see this with Spectre instead. And in Spectre, I made the same boosts in the same places. Watch the crest factor, listen to the sound. Okay, so we went from 11.6 to 10.8. That's almost a, almost a dB of improvement in crest factor. Not amazing, not nearly as much as the big broadband saturators did, but instead of saturating everything, I am saturating the specific points I want in the spectrum, and it's a much smoother result, much more even result, definitely sounds better than Pro-Q3, and it's reducing my crest factor. This is basically, I think the way I'm going to put it is, every time I'm tempted to boost EQ to change the timbre of a sound, I stop myself and I reach for Spectre instead, because Spectre always sounds better, because it doesn't mess with the phase because of the way it works. Spectre is a parallel saturator, and it's a parallel multiband saturator. So the way it works is, if I crank this mix knob here, all, right now it's at 50%, but if I crank it all the way over to 100%, you're gonna hear the second parallel track with these saturation boosts in it. So those are just the harmonics that are being produced from these two bells. Like if I turn this one off, it'll be a little more obvious. Okay, that's this section of the original waveform being boosted with a tube saturation effect running in a parallel channel. And then when I dial the mix back to 50%, that thin little extra amount of harmonics is being blended back into the original signal. So all these harmonics are being added into the signal and that's where saturate from the bottom comes from, from the bottom. I'm taking these small, quiet, saturated sounds and adding them back into the original sound. Okay, if we turn on this bell, oops, this one, right? Then again, there's more stuff going on because that's a pretty big amount of saturation and a pretty, um, heavy area. So this is what just the saturated sound is like. Okay. And if I flip it over to this side, we're hearing just the dry signal, the original dry signal. And of course, it's attenuated because this is a dry wet mix. Now, if I put it to 50% again, And that's just delicious. Listen to it compared to the, the original. Listen to how it fattens up the original dry signal. See, it gives you that extra 
energy in this er region without making it harsher, without introducing any phase cancellation compared to the original signal. It's just wonderful. Let me A, B this back and forth with Pro-Q3 just to show you how much better it sounds than doing it with an equalizer. So this is with Spectre. And this is Pro-Q3. Hear how that sounds thin and honky and then it's phasing weirdly as it sweeps up the, the frequency spectrum? One more time, I'm just gonna go back and forth without talking. It's just doing it with an EQ is honky, it's harsh creating all this phasing. It just sounds like dog shit compared to Spectre. I'm sorry, it just really does. So to me, Spectre is worth every penny. It's an amazing tool for saturation. And as you can see, it does in many cases control the crest factor uh, and it improves it. And it's just really, really excellent, excellent sound design and coloring tool. So I can't recommend this one enough and I use it all the time. Now let's look at uh, New York compression. So I don't, I'm not a fan of New York compression. I don't have any of the other things like babies, I love New York or whatever. And I don't want to take the time to set it up in a, something like FabFilter Pro C. So I'm just going to be lazy. Punch is uh, a pretty good, pretty good plugin. It's a weird little toolkit for dynamics. I use it sometimes just because there's certain things you can do nicely here. I do like its approach to transients. Um, but it also has this interesting New York compression built in, and it's it's definitely New York compression. So here's a certain amount of New York compression to keep the signal at the same volume as everything else. You're gonna be able to hear why I don't like New York compression in this. New York compression is a parallel compressor. And in the parallel signal, you squash this into oblivion. You squash this into a thin line of, of just pancake mush, and it's just noise. And then you blend that noise back into the original signal, which again is kind of like saturating or thickening from the bottom. And when you increase the bottom more than, and don't really change the tops, that's why everyone in the old days loved New York compression because it was a way to not have to squash or clip your peaks in any way. You could just add thickness from the middle, from the bottom. Um, the problem is New York saturation brings up the noise floor and it brings up reverb tails and it brings up all the things you want to decay nicely and, and drop out of the listener's awareness. New York compression is just going to raise those right up into your face and it sounds terrible on certain kinds of sounds. It can sound great on other kinds of sounds, but definitely not this sound. And you'll see why here. But watch the crest factor. Okay, so the big problem is that it just brings the reverb tail up way too high all of a sudden. So if I were, if I liked the sound of New York compression, I could put some sort of automation on the reverb part. I could drag this down so it didn't bring up that reverb tail so long and washy. But you can see it did reduce the crest factor quite a bit. We were at 11.6, now we're at 7.9. So, you know, if you like New York compression or you think that's the right kind of sound, as part of your sound design, by all means reach for it and know that it will be a uh, reducing crest factor. And then let's talk about tape saturation. Now, I said earlier, tape saturation is a little unpredictable. On certain types of signals, it will reduce crest factor pretty noticeably. On other types of signals, it probably will stay the same or only reduce it by the tiniest bit. 
But there's no question tape saturation is yummy and sounds good. <laughs> uh, so let's hear what this one sounds like. And now watch the crust factor. All right, so we were at 11.6. Yeah, it brought us down to about, it was about 10.8. I stopped it a little too late. So it did bring down the crest factor a little bit. It certainly sounds good. I mean, this is a great sounding saturation. Um, it's not as dramatic as the other ones, and it is different in timbre than, say, using Spectre. So let's just briefly, let's end this by just doing a quick A-B of all of these approaches. You, you get the point. Saturation good, do it first. Don't be afraid to make your sounds hotter and brighter and warmer and fatter through some amount of saturation before you even think about clipping. I don't want you just coming along and using um, CTZ clippers at the end of every track without having done this kind of stuff first. Take care of your sound design first. Make sure you're starting with a really good sound you've already paid attention to and made as loud as possible through all the normal conventional sound design things we do as both producers and as mixing engineers. Clipping is the last. Clipping is the final extra mile to get those peaks down even further if you need to. And that's the point I really want to make clear because I in my earlier Clip to Zero videos, um, I think based on questions and comments I, I got, a lot of people just said, oh, I'll just use a clipper on everything, and that's the magic button to make everything loud. Well, it will make everything loud, but you can do it even more transparently if you pay attention to your sound design first. If you, if you do some of the dynamic range reduction by consciously and deliberately coloring your sound with saturation, do that first. Find that nice sweet spot where the sound is just juicy and thick, okay? And then put a clipper on top of that. Don't just run some thin ass thing straight out of serum right into a track to zero clipper, a, a clip to zero pair, right? Don't just do that because then you're just going to add harshness. You could do a lot more, um, you could have much better, cleaner, smoother, less harsh, more pleasant results if you saturated that thin little crappy thing coming out of serum first and got it nice and fat and beefy using any of these kinds of techniques. Then put a clipper on it for the last mile. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next video. Okay, so let's just do a final A, B of some of these. I'm just going to walk through them one by one. Here's the original sound, and I'm just going to compare it with saturation knob a couple times. So saturation knob is just straight up soft clipping, and to me it sounds too harsh. It sounds harsh and, and janky. I don't like it. All right, let's try Saturn. Here's the dry sound first, and then I'll turn on Saturn. Now, that's some pretty transparent soft clipping, okay? That sounds so much better than that janky saturation knob, right? It's much smoother. It's much closer to the original. You almost don't hear any coloration, but you definitely saw a reduced crest factor. Now, let's hear Spectre versus the original. So, first, the dry signal. See how I managed to pull up some energy in that dangerous honky range around 400? 
I wanted more beef there, but I don't want it to be honky. I don't want it to sound pinched and boxy and honky, right? Spectre can do it. Spectre is amazing. I mean, I don't care where you put it in the spectrum. If, you, if I wanted to beef up the low end, if I wanted to bring up the air, just Spectre is just delicious candy gloss on everything. It's so much cleaner than an EQ. Okay, let's hear it with just an EQ, trying to bump those same regions again. We'll start with the dry sound. Hear how it gets honky and it gets piercing and it gets phasey and loses some of the resonant things as it's sweeping up through two and three K. Ugh, nasty, nasty stuff. Okay, here's uh, New York compression on and off. We'll start with the dry signal. And that's why I hate New York compression. It's just way too harsh. It's a, it's a sledgehammer. This is a surgical scalpel of beautiful candy gloss. And this is an ugly, ugly sledgehammer. Well, not punks. Punch is really good. But New York compression sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. And then uh, let, finally, we'll, we'll check the tape saturation, which is going to sound really good. It's I, nothing wrong with a good tape saturator. First, the dry signal. Okay. I still think in this particular case, on that particular sound, Tape saturation exposes a little harshness up around the 2 and 3K range, but that's me. Uh, on other things, tape saturation is amazing. Certainly on a big full mix, tape saturation can be wonderful. I often put it on my pre-master. Um, but there you go. A quick roundup of saturating from the bottom. This will set you up for the next video much, much better. Okay, see you next time.